car owners typically underestimate how much owning their car costs by 52%. This is from a recent representative study of about 6,000 people, meaning cars cost about twice as much as we think they do. And that's just half the problem. Here in Germany, where gas and labor costs are high, owning a Volkswagen Golf, which is a tiny car, costs more than 7,600 euros a year directly to the owner. A tiny Opel Corsa, which you could probably not even buy in the US these days, came out just under 7,000 euros a year. And a fancy Mercedes SUV above 12,000 euros a year. And these are prices calculated in 2020 before the fuel and inflation crisis, mind you. People are apparently pretty spot on about estimating their fuel costs outside of the fuel crisis, that is, but wildly underestimate depreciation, maintenance, and everything else. In the US, the average car payment now is 8,544 US dollars a year in 2022, that is, likely due to the astronomically high new gas prices and people owning bigger cars over there. And if a person buys a new vehicle every 12 years, which is the average replacement cycle in the US, then they pay 9,282 US dollars a year on average. That's a ton of money. Must be all those damn taxes you're paying, right? Well, actually, it's quite the opposite. On top of what the owners pay, a car in Germany also costs its society an additional 4,600 to 5,200 euros a year, as owners pay nowhere near enough taxes and fees to pay for building and maintaining roads and parking, let alone for offsetting the cost of pollution, accidents, etc. Let that sink in. Every year, in developed countries at least, societies subsidize drivers by about 5,000 euros each. And the more expensive the car, of course, the more we subsidize it. Cars are insanely expensive to both the individuals owning them and also to society. So in this video, let's break down why and what the cost of some of the alternatives are. In this video, I'll be throwing around a lot of numbers, so I actually made a spreadsheet with every calculation and every source that I've used, and I put that down in the description. You can check everything yourself, make some calculations on your own, or find any mistakes that I might have made. If you catch something, let me know, and I'll pin any corrections into the comments below. All right, let's take a look at the direct cost of owning cars first, which is paid by the owner, and let's put that into a little bit of context. So we'll pick a German Volkswagen Golf, which is a small, efficient car even by European standards. This is the breakdown of how we got to 7,657 euros a year. And as I said, fuel costs are what people are okay at estimating, while everything else they're usually wildly off about. So just how much money is that in total? Well, the best study that I could find calculated that for 50 years of owning a Golf or an equivalent car at average replacement rates, the lifetime total cost is 403,179 euros, assuming a historically relevant 1-2% to inflation rate. Almost half a million euros, and I've cross-checked with German and US Auto Club estimates, as well as those from tax authorities, and the study puts car costs somewhere in between those various estimates, so I suppose it's not too far off. But also note that the Golf is below average in most developed nations, car ownership rarely stops at 50 years, and the study used a now completely unrealistically low-seeming inflation rate. Say you'd pick a 60-year time frame starting now, not 25 years ago, and an inflation rate of maybe 2.5%, and you'd be looking at more than 1.5 million euros over your lifetime. For a golf. Damn. But let's go back to the very conservative estimate from the study for this video for some more figures. Here's a handy little table showing how much of the lifetime net income a German person by income group would have to spend on those 403,000 euros. Even for highly paid senior employees, it's 15% of lifetime income, but for the lower three income groups, it's about 30 to 40%. 30 to 40% of all the money one will ever make spent on on owning a small car on average, that's a lot. And just to show how much that is, let's compare it to some alternatives. Now, I'll pick Berlin to compare because A, I live here and I can film here, and B, the city has a relatively even split between people driving cars, taking public transport, and walking or cycling, so you could actually make a somewhat meaningful comparison. In fact, there are about 34 cars for every 100 residents, and about 42 residents out of 100 take public transportation twice a day, while biking and walking infrastructure is also 
also okay. It's not the Netherlands or Copenhagen, but you definitely can bike if you want, and it's how I usually get around the city myself. In other words, Berlin is about as close as we'll get to a city with a somewhat equal split between the different traffic types, which makes a comparison possible in the first place. So let's start with an all-inclusive yearly public transportation ticket that includes the whole city and all of its suburbs. It costs 978 euros. Most of the 800,000 plus people with active passes actually pay a lot less because there are company discounts and student discounts and you could choose to only pay for some of the zones, etc. But let's just use the highest possible price here, 978 euros. Now, of course, this is not a full replacement for a car because what if you have to leave the city every now and then? Well, let's take another extreme solution. You can buy a yearly all-inclusive ticket for German Rail for 4,144 euros. I don't know anyone who has a ticket like that because I guess it only makes sense for people who would commute hundreds of kilometers back and forth every day or whatever. But again, let's pick the most expensive thing possible for the sake of the argument. So together, you're now at 5,122 euros a year. Sounds like a lot, but that's still 2,500 euros cheaper than a Golf was in 2020, and unlike the Golf, this includes unlimited travel both inside your city and outside. So from that leftover, you could do a couple of things. For example, you could buy a bike. I have fairly fancy bikes. This Peugeot cost me about 1,000 euros, including accessories, while this cowboy e-bike review unit that I have here is 2,800 euros brand new. If you want to check it out, there's an affiliate link to this one down in the description. So you could buy almost a whole new, very fancy e-bike once a year, or like two to three regular bikes every year on top of unlimited public transport. If you thought buying Bike theft was a financial issue, which by the way it is, I think this really contextualizes that a little. But what if you're not a biker and instead you need a car every now and then just to get around or to make family trips or whatever? Well, you can get one of these. Car sharing costs about 10 to 30 euros for a short trip here in Berlin. A day trip costs 64 euros with this car, while two full days would set you back 109 euros. I'll let you make some calculations for yourself based on your car use here, but unless you need a car multiple times a day, literally just using car sharing whenever you do want to have a car would still be cheaper than owning a car. Or if your household has multiple cars, maybe you could consider only keeping one around and doing the occasional other trip with a shared car. So those are the theoretical maximums. And I think in many cases, they still look cheaper than just having a simple cheap car, which is pretty amazing. But now let's actually look at what I spend in Berlin as somebody who is single and lives in the city center, which I think is about as close to a theoretical minimum as we'll find. Last year, I spent 172 euros on public transport tickets, taking the subway occasionally. I spent 419 euros on long distance trains, making two trips back and forth to Germany, and another 51 euros on car sharing when I had to pick up some furniture or something similar. That's a total of 642 euros. I also own bikes, of course, which are a bit hard to account for, but let's just assume a very generous 1000 euros a year, so I have plenty of room for maintenance and replacing a stolen bike, at which point I'd be at 1,642 euros a year, compared to someone owning the Golf that has savings of 316,000 euros in 50 years of use. Now, I don't have kids and I don't have to go outside of the city all that much, so I definitely spend less money on travel than even the average Berliner, but do note that I'm not poor, I'm not actively trying to save a lot of money on transportation, it's just that I live in a city where I don't need a private vehicle that I have to pay a ton of money for. So in the end, I think anything between a thousand and maybe four thousand euros a year is very realistic for most people living in a place with halfway decent car alternatives, which means saving thousands of euros every year. So now you might be thinking, yeah, but your socialist public transport system is costing us, the good car driving citizens, tons of tax money, and you damn bikers aren't paying for your infrastructure either. Which is true, but also maybe not so fast. The total cost of running the Berlin public 
public transport company is 1.3 billion euros a year and an average of 224 million euros is also spent on building out new lines, buying new vehicles, etc. Out of that, around half is subsidized by the government. Sounds like a lot, except that is 427 euros of subsidies per frequent rider per year. Reminder, the cumulative cost to society of even the cheapest car in our study is 4,674 euros a year. 11 times as much for an Opel Corsa. Even if the government were to make public transportation fully free in Berlin and even stop making revenue from things like ads in the subway stops or whatever, we'd still be at about 1,005 euros per frequent rider per year. And I know that a car can be used both inside the city and outside, and it can carry multiple people and objects, so this isn't like an apples to apples comparison, but even our smallest vehicles right now cost our societies four to five times as much as completely free public transportation would cost a city like Berlin. And this doesn't even include one of government subsidies like the up to 9,000 euros per year that a person can get for buying an electric car here in Germany, which is the equivalent of 21 years of public transportation subsidies at current rates, or the similar programs governments across the world have rolled out after the 2008 economic crash to literally pay people to buy new cars, including ones that are absolutely not electric. I mean, even just the Germany-wide average of current curbside parking subsidies alone, which is about 1,005 euros per car that the government just gives to drivers mostly for free, that alone costs as much as completely free public transportation would cost the city of Berlin. And parking is actually one of the easiest ways to explain just how insane some of our systems are. First, most countries mandate that single-family homes and businesses have to build a certain number of garages. Don't have a car? You must build one anyway. Why? Because parking on the street would be stupidly expensive for the government, but most governments are too afraid to charge people even just a fair market rate for parking outside, lest they revolt. According to the book Movement, the market value of a parking space in Amsterdam is about 3,600 euros a year. That's how much somebody would pay to rent an equivalent amount of land. A residence parking fee, in contrast, is 535 euros. In London, renting a parking space-sized amount of flat costs 8,000 British pounds, but residents only pay 158 pounds a year for a parking spot. And right here in Berlin, I think we have the most insane situation of them all. First, only the highlighted areas require anyone to pay for on-street parking to begin with, the rest is completely free, and if you actually live somewhere in the red, you can park on one of your streets around you for 10.2 euros a year. 10.2 euros, that is Latin for tax money paying for your parking. Reminder, there are 34 cars for every 100 Berliners, and yet about 80% of a regular street like this, even in the city center, is taken up by cars, with everyone else smooshed around the edges, and about half of the car space is used to store private vehicles basically for free at the expense of everyone else. I can't even park a bike in one of these spaces or have a barbecue or store a trash bin in them. The city will literally employ people to come and take all of that away and find me, by the way, if they can. Meanwhile, bikes, scooters, everything else has to be parked on the sidewalk and, by the way, this tiny spot parks 20 of them, while the entire rest of the street also parks 20 cars. Doesn't quite seem fair. Combined with the mandatory private parking requirements, free on-street parking really just creates state-enforced parking requirements. Which is like socialism, except you're not paying taxes for hospitals or schools or whatever, but rather the government saying that you must pay for car parking whether you own a car or not, whether you live in the city or whether you have your own house. The libertarians among you especially should be really angry at this system. And we're so used to the system that we think it's some kind of immutable constant. But these places could allow for businesses to expand, which would then pay the city rent for the space that they use. They could allow for trees to be planted to create alleys to bring city temperatures and air conditioning costs down. One could replace one of the two sides in every street to make almost universal protected bike lanes across the city with almost no need to build extra infrastructure. You could make playgrounds and shared spaces like 
smart cities are already starting to do. Or, you know, the city could just keep things as it is and actually charge drivers a fair market rate so they can lower all of their other taxes. In fact, if we revisit this table again, but now the version that shows total cost of ownership, including social externalities, we find that the lower three income groups would have to pay about half or more of their entire lifetime income to own a Volkswagen Golf, which is obviously not sustainable or possible even, while even the wealthier people would struggle at about a quarter to a third of their income. And meanwhile, a Mercedes SUV would be a significant financial drag on even millionaires. But because people underestimate their own costs by half, they don't know what's keeping them poor, and because governments spent all of their money on this insanely expensive system instead of everything else, these machines then become the only viable option for many people in the end anyway. Okay, so I think you get the point, cars are expensive. But many people of course think that alternatives are not realistic either. So let's take a look at the most common counter arguments that I keep hearing everywhere. Argument 1. But I like my car, or but I need my car even in my city. Sure, cars sometimes make sense, even financially, depending on the job that you have or the family situation that you're in, etc. Just make sure that you actually understand your full costs before making a financial decision, and I think you should actually pay for all of the externalities, including like a few thousand euros in parking alone if you live in a city, plus all of the other stuff. Why should others pay for it? And the government shouldn't spend all of its money building infrastructure only for you, but should give others who don't want or don't need cars a real alternative. Argument 2. Living car-free only works in cities. How about those living on the countryside? Well, lucky for us, about 80% of the population of just about any developed country lives in cities, suburbia, towns, etc. And this rate is increasing everywhere. I'm not proposing that every farmer in Wisconsin should haul their livestock around on bikes, or that on-street parking in rural Norway should cost 3,000 euros a year, but the vast majority of us live somewhere that absolutely has or can have enough density for car alternatives. Argument 3. Trains don't work in big countries like the US and Canada. Well, yeah, except again, this is where the majority of the population in both countries lives. These areas typically have comparable overall density to European and Asian equivalents, many of which have very viable train systems, so geography really isn't to blame here. Here's a good Not Just Bikes video about how things work in Switzerland, for example. Argument 4. My country built this one train track or this one bike lane somewhere and nobody uses it. It's a waste of money. And yeah, you're right. Building random disconnected bits of infrastructure that don't properly connect to anything is a complete waste of money. Here's a whole video about such a disaster system where transit stops in places like LA typically end up in completely human hostile environments. This is in fact a waste of money and I've linked this incredible video down in the description. When places do build whole networks though with real thought and proper resources, people do use them. And don't just listen to me in Berlin. Here's a video about Paris doing this for bikes, a small US town called Emeryville doing it with bikes, Toronto doing it with public transportation as well, and there are lots more where those came from. Build a system and build it well and people will come. Build random lines in the middle of nowhere and they will not. Argument 5. But building a whole system is expensive and requires bulldozing existing infrastructure. Well, guess how the highways landed in the middle of cities? Everything was bulldozed to the ground for like 6 to 7 decades in cities and across the countryside. Tram tracks were ripped up and people were thrown out of their flats. Yes, change is expensive, but nothing will ever be remotely as expensive to build or even just to maintain as the current car dependent infrastructure that we have. Argument 6. But public transportation is a smelly and full of people. Well, yeah, because all the money was spent on cars instead. Try spending like 7,500 euros in your own money and then another 5,000 euros in government subsidies on trains and bikes for the next 70 years and we'll see where that will get you. Argument 7. But the weather. Well, some of the hottest places on Earth have great public transportation systems, while the biking capitals of the world are about as rainy and cold as places can get. So, yeah, I don't think that's very convincing. And I could go on forever. The point is that cars can be practical and useful in many situations to many people. 
but making cities where they are the only realistic way to get around keeps people poor and keeps taxes high. If you have the choice to avoid them completely or to somehow have one less car per family, I really recommend that you try and if you can somehow influence your government, even better. Alright, I don't have a sponsor this week, but if you want to check out the e-bike that I've used in this video, this is a Cowboy 4 review unit that the company sent me, and I've left an affiliate link to that down in the description. If you use that link to buy a Cowboy that helps my channel financially, hopefully you have a fantastic car-free rest of the week, and I'll see you in the next video.